My name is Bruce Posner, and I'm the person responsible for the production and supervision of the Moana with Sound Restoration Project. We have a few interesting clips from the production that uh, I thought you might like to see. So we're going to uh, show you uh, three or four parts of the restoration process related to Moana with Sound. What you're looking at now is a side-by-side -side comparison that shows you the best possible scenario that could be managed under the uh, budget constraints and the technical limitations of the material we were working with, and, and of course, the genius uh, abilities of Thomas Bakels at Alpha Omega Digital in Munich. And what you see on the left is the uh, original print from 1925. It's a work print that was used to uh, screen uh, for Bob Flaherty and Francis and to see what audiences responded to. And it's slightly different than the released film, but all the footage is there, and it's the best possible source that we were able to find from a worldwide search. Uh, the problems are enormous, uh, basically being that uh, Bob processed the film on site, and you can see the emulsion lifting off, uh, the nitrate deterioration, and uh, various softnesses related to the way the film was printed. This is exciting because this is Thomas Bagel's method at Alpha Omega Digital, and that is to use liquid gate, which we're seeing a, a, a raw scan on the left, and on the right we're seeing the results of using liquid gate and timing in a uh, 2K environment uh, in a linear format, not log. Here is a famous scene in the film of the uh, palm tree climbing, and on the left it's as the liquid gate made it look in the scanning. They're pretty darn good, but look what Thomas did when he processed it on the right. Incredible. Most of the uh, technology today can make very easy 24 to 16 to 18 frame movements, so silent films will look the way they should, not herky-jerky, but nice smooth movements like the filmmaker intended. The problem is in the pans, either horizontal pans or vertical pans, and on the left you see the stabilized footage from our first pass of at the beginning of the film going down the tree. What we needed to do was restabilize that on a second pass to get that nice smooth movement. When we were searching for footage uh, of the film, it, it became very difficult because there wasn't that much. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of prints that MoMA had circulated, and this was the MoMA footage that was made in 1936 or so off the Harvard print that was from the late 20s, early 30s, given to Harvard University, which they loaned to the Museum of Modern Art. And most, subs most subsequent copies around the world were generated from this, and through the FIOF uh, archive collections, they would trade films, and this is how the film got around most of Eastern Europe and Russia. So what we're seeing here is a uh, end of uh, uh, one reel with the, uh, the, the water scene, and you can see what a mess it is, and it's compared to a sequence here from the uh, Swedish Film Institute and the British Film Institute, and you see the deficiencies there. And then we had to match these and another one from, uh, I believe it's Krakow, with the 16 millimeter, which you see in the bottom left corner. This is Monica's 1980 16 millimeter print, so we're comparing everything. <laughs> And when we got to the dance scene, you can see it just goes all crazy with the different printing anomalies and mistakes. <laughs> the Swedish print in the British Film Archive, and then eventually this four screen piece which shows you several other archives. And in the bottom left corner is the British Film Institute film slightly fixed up to show you how good it might end up being. The final demonstration here, which is pretty exciting, is when you see all of these materials next to one another uh, with the color-coded sequencing whenever there's missing frames, because you might find the footage, but you didn't find all the footage. So the, the, the red and the green color jumping on the screen is that material right there. And now here's the beauty of archive work. When you see what I call a shot, the butt and the hand, and here's a, uh, unfortunately, really bad copy first. And it's followed by the four quads with the British Film Institute and the Swedish and, and, uh, and compared to one another. And then the last shot, I think it's the one we used, was from a fine grain from the British Film Institute. But you can see my work is quite difficult. We had the 16 millimeter Monica print from 1980, the composite sound print. 
the nitrate positive print from 1925 from the Library of Congress, supplemented with British Film Institute material from the 1950s, copied from a 1930 print, and then a little bit of stuff from New Zealand and from Monica 16 to fill out the picture. We would uh, scan this material in the methods we showed you earlier, and then they would be transferred to 1080 files, which was sent to an editor, Brett Hampton, in Valencia, California, where he reconstructed the program in the center screen here, or the, the middle section, where you see all the information around the side. You see the different coding, like LOC number seven, or whatnot, and the, what reel it was. And then you also see the coding on the side for the exact frame, so the location of the shots could be easily arranged and managed. Brett would uh, organize these and make the spatial corrections so the scenes were the right length to match Monica's print. One of the problems here was that one size shoe didn't fit all. Monica literally worked scene by scene to readjust the sound. So you might have 14 frames a second, you might have 16 frames a second, you might have 20 frames a second. The titles, I believe, overall were 24 frames a second. So you had to interweave these various frame rates and be very conscientious, and the soundtrack is what locked us in. We had to match the soundtrack to the picture. And in the third image, set of images here, is uh, these files, these 1080 files of Brett Hampton would be sent to Thomas in Munich, and in fact, they would be then put together with the processed raw 35 millimeter film that Thomas was processing while Brett was editing, and Thomas would conflate that to the 1080 file and we had the final picture. Incredible genius work and done a great economy. This is the most fun and maddening part of the restoration. This is from uh, the uh, Library of Congress from the nitrate and the BF5 safety film. And you see how both with the red and green uh, spots where the numbers are showing you where there's missing frames or footage. So this is maddening when you're in a scene where uh, you don't have a complete shot in any way that you could source from one or the other. Um, in the process of doing the restoration, at the absolute last moment of the project, we got connected to the materials that were buried in the New Zealand Film Archive, which I believe are probably really, really good materials once they go through digital processing. But we had very little time, even with the help of uh, Peter Jackson and the Park Rose Studios. We, we only got in at the last second. This is a shot complete, and it looks beautiful. I don't believe we used this in the final, and I still don't remember why. Nonetheless, here's another scene where we were missing a shot of Ma looking through the palm leaves. As you can see here on the left was what we had, and what was New Zealand provided and we used in the film was on the right for another shot down the line in the editing sequence. Or you have this most perverse set of sequences where you have a pan. Look at this pan down this palm tree. Uh, I think it was the beginning of Reel 5. It was a nightmare, no matter what source. There's the Library of Congress source, and here's a comparison of the Library of Congress and the British Film Institute. And then here's what Thomas Bakels at Alpha Omega was able to do with it. Is that absolutely stunning or what? And so here you are seeing it again, the raw, unprocessed footage next to the process finished. It's funny though, I have a funny feeling it never made it into the final film somehow. <laughs> but this is what happens sometimes, and I'll give you an idea why. We were working around the world around the clock. Um, the project basically started where German time, going to London time, going to New York time and New Hampshire, or, or actually I was in New Hampshire and Miami, then that going to California time, and then at the end of the process, we got to New Zealand, which put it basically around the clock. And then at the very, very end, because the premiere was going to be in Moscow, we were in Moscow. So we were basically working a 24-hour clock of sending files back and forth and around. A lot of fun. But I'm going to show you a few examples. I kind of alluded to it in the last part, but let's go all the way over the edge here. Um, and maybe danger is too strong of a word. The Kava pounding scene is amidst the, uh, the mess of Reel 7 from the Library of Congress. I mean, there was Reel 4 of the Library of Congress was totally missing because it had burned up at a certain point. We only had the dupe uh, negative that the Library of Congress had made of it, which Thomas was able to process very, very well. It looks beautiful. 
in, in what we used mostly in the film, and related British Film Institute material, which we related, which was, again was downstream further in generations. This is an example of real seven when the nitrate deterioration is taking effect, and you're all familiar with this. Well, eventually, we were able to find at the New Zealand Film Archive this footage here, which again, I said was probably quite beautiful. It's just we didn't have time to really deal with getting it shipped across the world and all that. We had to do digital files, and it was problems. But nonetheless, you see how great that is. We wish we could have gone further, more time, money, et cetera, et cetera. Here is a color sample, and it's based off the color stills that Francis Flaherty made next to the camera while the film was being shot. Almost every shot in the film has a still camera shot of Francis took right next to the camera throughout the whole film, so we have a good register. But the color of her prints have this beautiful sapia golden color that uh, people uh, that were around at the time or later knew Francis or Monica said they'd seen these prints that were just gorgeous. And Francis Flaherty always talked about the incredible skin color of the Samoans that was missing in the final film. This skin color issue was the whole goal and why we, why we decided to use, or I decided to use, the Library of Congress nitrate print because it was the closest in reproducing a full tonal range as much as it could. It suffered on other levels of being soft and, and having some other anomalies printed in, the shrinkage. But nonetheless, you got the most tonal range of all the material that I saw. But here we were attempting to do the color, and you could see how beautiful it would have been. But since there was no definite register anywhere, we opted against it. And then this final little bit, you saw this earlier, uh, the, the full Monty restoration. And this is, every restorer faces this problem. Notice in his armpit, that fly that disappears, well, it was cleaned out in the automatic cleaning, and we had to put the fly back in. Anyhow, um, I hope you enjoyed these examples. Thank you.